Hi, welcome to our class on St. Augustine. This week, that's all we're covering. And in learning more about him, you may learn about yourself. And it'll be interesting. A lot of what we believe as Catholics, uh, Augustine wrote very powerfully about. And that's the reason why he's a doctor of the church. We call someone a doctor of the church when they have really made a big difference. And you'd be surprised uh, at the people. I'm going to try and cover some other ones in the uh, week that we cover saints in general and help you pick your uh, uh, saint for confirmation, your saint name. But a uh, doctor of the church is somebody that changed things for the better uh, in some way, gave us some new insight, it said he or she said something way better. Uh, and yeah, there's both men and women are doctors of the church. Some of them that will surprise you. Uh, uh, Therese of the Sioux, uh, the little flower, Santa Teresita, uh, is a doctor of the church. And deservedly so. And when you find out why she's a doctor of the church, you're going to be, you might be a little amazed. And it's certainly really cool. Okay, so uh, there's way more here than we could cover in a little bit. And I know you have your regular school and everything too. Uh, but do take a look at the links. Uh, among those links, you'll find uh, a link to an audiobook. If you want to listen to the one whole book written by Augustine, you could do that. It's a lot better read than you'd expect. Uh, I do have other books of his. Here, uh, this is the Confessions, okay, right there, and it's a good book. Uh, this is actually a really good translation, I'm told. Uh, and also, this is another book of his called The City of God, which was written later. And I would read Confessions before I'd read this one. Most famous quote by Saint Augustine probably is, "All hearts are restless until they rest in Thee." The book, his book, The Confessions, that's what it's from, is uh, written as a prayer to God. So it's telling God, it's reflecting on his life in a prayer to God. So he's talking to God and saying, you know, I remember this when I was going to school. And I remember that they weren't really teaching me stuff that I felt was really a good thing. And I wasn't that interested. And then later I really got interested. I mean, he's really, it's just like he's talking to a friend. Uh, I think St. Augustine said something like, you know, God is a friend closer than any friend. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. You'll see that in some of the stuff, I think. Uh, and by the way, I put a link to quotes from St. Augustine. You should look at the links. I mean, look at that link for the quotes and just look them over and see if there's a quote you really like. If there's a quote you really like, tell me about it in your response. That would be really, really cool. Besides, I'll know you actually got this far. Uh, but seriously, uh, you're going to like at least some of those quotes. And I'll leave one of the shocking ones to see if anybody catches it. There's one that I feel like I want to give you a bonus point or something if you catch it. But I'll, if you catch it, I'll tell you. How's that? And I hope you're getting my, my I think they come back and email my comments and stuff. Uh, and everybody's getting top grades all the time. I don't grade, I give anybody a three or something. You know, just I'm always going to put it to the max. If you do anything, it's going to be great. Uh, okay, the quotes on the links. Uh, there's audiobook in there, which is long, but if you like to listen to that sort of thing, you could do that. You could fall asleep and do sleep learning of Augustine. Uh, so the reason I put this together for you, I'm reading this now so I don't get it wrong, is because Augustine, when he was looking back on his life, said that school didn't teach him what he really needed. What he needed was to live well, uh, not just make money. He really wanted to understand life. And, you know, if you talk to anybody, they'll say, well, that's not what school is for. But, you know, maybe it should be. And it's not that they just tell you what life is about, but they're helping you to find things that help you. Back in those days, it was actually better than now. And Augustine wasn't happy with it. Uh, anyway, so sometimes you may feel that all the focus in education is on making money, getting a job, you know, being a good citizen and all that kind of stuff. Um, and not necessarily, you know, living. Uh, anyway, and sometime I'll tell you about my own experience with that, uh, which I think you'll enjoy and you will be surprised because uh, I, yeah, anyway, if you remember, I, I said in the initial thing that I wasn't born Catholic, neither was Augustine, I came to it later in life. Uh, okay, so talking about living, God created you to live. You know, people a lot of the time focus on God created you to serve him, to be a kind of slave or something. No, 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 no. He really, really created us to live, and we are a gift to ourselves. I mean, God gave me, me, he gave me life as a gift to me to enjoy that life, and that life is more enjoyable lived in him, 
and having a friend that's God. I mean, that this kind of makes sense to me now. It didn't make sense to me when I was young. Um, but also we're a gift to each other. So even if, you know, you choose not to do anything about it or I choose not to, you're a gift to me. I'm a gift to you. We're a gift to each other uh, and to the whole universe, really. Uh, you just never know. You're more important than you realize. Uh, also, as part of living means that God, in giving life, gives it to us, wanting us to be happy. So, it might not always be happy in this life, but the end goal here in God's way of creating and, and desire to create is that we would be free and happy. And you'd be surprised how hard that could be to be both. Because if you're free, sometimes you're free. We talked about free will. Sometimes you're free to make bad decisions that hurt you. And in that case, you won't be happy. But you're really choosing not to be happy when you choose to do the wrong thing. And the wrong thing we should spend more time on. But it's going to be, it's, that's why we have a morality book in this course. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, also, one thing is you'll hear me refer to him as Augustine. And I don't always say St. Augustine, and I don't always, uh, I don't even know if he really technically had a last name. I've never actually seen one, because the last names are kind of a newer thing. Uh, there's family names, uh, but anyway. So the point is, uh, he's Augustine of Hippo. That's how we refer to him. But the reason we call them by their first names when they have regular first names um, is because they're our friends. The saints are our friends. They're part of the church. And in the church, we don't have the idea that some people are way higher and other people are way lower. Sometimes it looks that way. But in, anyway, so we'll talk more about that later, too. Uh, anyway, Augustine, when he got old, realized that... I always forget sometimes to look right at the camera here. I end up looking off someplace else or something because I'm thinking, or I, I have a thing there blocking my screen. You can try that trick sometimes, so I'll look at the camera and not at myself in the screen, because like, why would I talk to myself that way? I do talk to myself, though. Uh, anyway, Augustine, as he got older, realized that people had so much respect for him, because he was, he was viewed as a giant in his own day. Uh, and we're still reading him 1,600 years later. His books are always in print. Somebody is always talking about Augustine. You'll see some stuff on that coming up, too. Just about every university in the world has a course that in some way or another covers Augustine. He's that big of a deal. Now, it doesn't mean if you go off and, and, you know, take classes in, oh, what would you take classes in? Something that didn't relate to anything to do with life. I don't know. Um, if you took a sociology class, you might not get Augustine. But if you take a psychology class, there's a good chance they'll cover what he wrote about memory as part of psychology. Uh, we'll cover that, too. Uh, anyway, so uh, he realized people were taking him so seriously that sometimes if he was wrong about something, people wouldn't question it. So it's good to understand that not everything Augustine said is church teaching. He was writing this when uh, Christianity was maybe 350 years, well, a little over 350 years old. Uh, that may seem not as old as 2,000 years, you're right, but it was old. I mean, that was still, if you look back to that, that would be looking like back before the United States was a country, from our point of view. Uh, so anyway, he was looking back at all that. Uh, and said, you know, don't take this too, I mean, take it seriously, but he said, look at what I wrote and take it on its own basis. You know, if it makes sense to you, good. If it doesn't, you want to criticize it uh, or give reasons why it's not right, that's fine. He wasn't trying to be the authority. Uh, although I will tell you that most of what's uh, in the catechism, the, the person most quoted outside of the Bible other than the Bible, Augustine's writings are the ones most quoted, most used in the Catechism, which is the document that summarizes the teaching of the church, but is not everything that's in the church necessarily. So I've collected these videos of various university professors, some stuff from movies, because you know I like to do that. Uh, it's going to start here in a little bit with a really bang up uh, three minute job that just kind of summarizes it. So he read a lot of old books, he asked a lot of questions, and he found what he was looking for. Uh, I hope that through these classes, you'll find what you're looking for, too. So here we go. I've come to talk to you about my son, Augustine. Is he still the smartest boy in his school? No, 
not our fault if we are made of matter, of evil. Your priests make you believe that you need God. But where is God? You can't see him, you can't hear him. Augustine! In Milan, they're searching for a new court orator. Remember all our dreams and ambitions? I told you that courage makes the difference between a great orator and an ordinary one. The courage to live without the truth. Do you have this courage? want the Emperor to be heard over Bishop Ambrose, you will need a more skillful orator than him. I have here a Manichaean, two Aryan Christians, a traditional pagan. It makes you wonder where the truth lies. The Emperor demands that you surrender this basilica. How dare you name God as your authority? Ah! <laughs> Only the truth will turn you into men. Free men. God is close to us. It's ink. God is more brother than any brother. Remember to use it all. He's more friend. Rejoices in good deeds. It is strong in suffering. A few basics about Augustine. He lived from 354 to 430, so about 1600 years ago. Lived to be about 75 years old. Uh, this picture here is Augustine with his mother Monica. She had moved to uh, live near Augustine after her husband died. And this depicts the time where they were talking right before she died about heaven and uh, and just reflecting on that and praying together. By the way, this is probably a more accurate picture of Augustine in how he generally looked than in the movie. Uh, I actually worked with a guy who was born not that far away from where Augustine was born, and they actually look a little bit alike. So Augustine lived in a time of rapid change. The Roman Empire was in decline. It was falling. In fact, uh, the city of Rome was sacked in 410 by the Visigoths. They were uh, coming down from the north. And sacked means that they, you know, burned the place. Uh, not everything burned it. Uh, stole things of value, took the food they had. The population of Rome after that uh, declined quite a bit, partly by starvation, uh, some think. The per persecutions of Christians had ended before Augustine's birth. Uh, and it became the official religion of Rome after he had lived some years, uh, not far off from the time that he got baptized. Uh, eventually, by the way, uh, the Visigoths came and attacked Hippo, which is where he was a bishop in North Africa. They pretty much followed the Mediterranean around, attacked Hippo, and Augustine died about when they were attacking. Uh, we don't know if he starved with a lot of the other people, but he stayed with, he stayed with his diocese when, uh, when they were attacked. Uh, it's good to know that it was an old world already when uh, Augustine lived. Uh, the church was almost 350 years old. The books he studied went back almost a thousand years. Uh, he grew up studying the Roman writers, you know, like Cicero was a big favorite of his, uh, which was at the time he lived was already 350, almost 400 years old. Uh, nothing really fresh was happening. Rome was just slowly falling. The Roman gods were the original government religion, but uh, things were shifting. So it was, it was a major time of change. Uh, he, his reflection on Rome, which he wrote in The City of God, another book that he wrote after the Confessions much later, uh, he said that they talked a lot about excellence uh, and how wonderful Rome was, but in fact, they had long since fallen from that. 
Uh, they had become so powerful that they didn't have any strong enemies. They got soft and corrupt, uh, decadent, and then when uh, invaders came in, they couldn't deal with it. So that's why they lost uh, to the Visigoths and were conquered, essentially. Uh, by the way, at this time, you know, this is around the year, you know, 354 up past 400. Augustine and pretty much everybody knew the world was round, despite what you might see. You can check this out if you uh, want to do a little research and you can ask me if you need sources, but it's not hard to find. Uh, by this time, there had been uh, quite a long time, more than a thousand years or about a thousand years of astronomy, geometry, physics. A lot of things were well established. A lot of the really big stuff uh, to come didn't happen until much later with Newton, which was, again, almost, well, about a little more than a thousand years after Augustine. So it's funny how things happen kind of bursts. Uh, but it's just good to know the people of this time were not ignorant. They actually knew quite a bit. And uh, and that's why they were able to build a lot of the things that they did and, and do a lot of the things that they did. You'd be surprised. Even the stuff of getting to the moon and going into space still relies on a lot of mathematics and geometry that's actually thousands of years old. So Augustine uh, grew up, of course, in Tagaste, traveled to Carthage at age 18 to learn a trade. Um, you know, it's hard to say. It's, it's back then to learn to be an orator, which, like a lawyer, uh, was very different. And they really mostly learned how to speak and <laughs> largely to fool people. But uh, so he went to that city to study under somebody, but it wasn't like a university. They would just have some place they hung out, sometimes at the teacher's own home. Uh, anyway, Carthage was uh, what is is a city in what is now Tunisia, which is planet Tatooine in the Star Wars sagas. In those movies, when you see that planet, like you see in this picture here, that was actually close to where Augustine uh, traveled to school at 18. Uh, he actually had a child at that time with somebody back then, uh, people in, in that area lived together, uh, and he did not keep her in time. His family told him that he had to send her away so he could marry somebody better, but he never married somebody else, And but he did keep his, in touch with his son. As a matter of fact, his son was also baptized when he was, or later. Uh, anyway, he went to Rome, uh, which was the capital by name, but the emperor had moved to Milan because of the invasions going on. So he eventually got to Milan and, and did some work for the emperor. Uh, after his conversion, baptism, he went back to North Africa, uh, lived essentially as a monk in community, but then took a trip to uh, Hippo, which was a place a little bit close by in North Africa as well. And the people grabbed a hold of him and wanted him to be their bishop. Uh, so his travels are a little bit like growing up in Anaheim, going to university in San Francisco, moving to New York for your career, then going to Washington, D.C. and hanging out with senators and the president and doing not so good things for them. Uh, and then hearing God's call, giving it all up to be a monk back in Anaheim and then becoming Bishop of Orange. Uh, and more on about that later, but it would be kind of like, you know, and then having Orange invaded. I don't know. That's where it all breaks down. So his parents, even though his mother was Catholic, uh, his parents were, they were not wealthy people, but they really wanted, wanted him to be a big success. Uh, they really pushed on that and were trying to find ways to, to get him into a good position. Uh, much, much later, she moved to uh, Milan to be close to Augustine after her husband died. And then she grew in her faith, probably partly because she was listening to the, to St. Ambrose, who was the bishop in Milan, who was a great speaker and a very powerful figure as well. Uh, going back to when he was in school, it wasn't giving him the education or the answers he wanted. He, looking back on it, he said that it really wasn't preparing him for life and uh, felt that was part of the reason why he kind of drifted and didn't uh, do very good things. He was out of school for a while because his parents couldn't afford it. Everybody had to pay for education then. It was never free. Uh, but they got him back in at 16. Uh, there was somebody that was local that had a lot of money that actually sponsored him and paid for his education. Uh, he became a star pupil, running, rising really fast. Uh, one of the things in that time is he really enjoyed the theater. Back then it was, of course, always live stuff. There were no movies. Uh, so he would see these plays. He had a friend named Olypius that actually would go to the uh, local, uh, it wasn't a Colosseum, that, that's a specific place, but go to see the gladi gladiatorial games. Uh, people actually killing each other uh, for sport. Uh, 
uh, in the in the arena for people to watch. And his friend Olypius didn't expect to like it, but he found himself addicted to it and couldn't stop going uh, and just seeing all of it. Uh, there were some really pretty horrible things going on. Uh, anyway, seeing his friend Olypius having that problem, especially after being so strong against it, uh, really made him think about his own attachment to lust and the problems that he had with women. Uh, Augustine was really split between career, sex, and wanting something he couldn't exactly identify. Uh, he had a longing for something, and he eventually found it through listening to San Ambrose, you know, a long time later. Uh, by the way, Manichaeism was a belief that he actually went into and stayed in it for about a decade. Uh, they d did not like the Christians. It said that we interpreted the Bible literally. They actually lied about that. Uh, you might hear that from some folks, but it's actually not true for the Catholic interpretation. Uh, it was a shock when Augustine heard Ambrose, St. Ambrose of Milan, uh, and in his preaching found out that what he'd been told about the faith was actually wrong because he'd mainly listened to people that didn't agree. He didn't actually go to anybody that really believed it. His mother was apparently not really strong in being able to do that until she uh, became older. Uh, anyway, he eventually realized that God was who he was looking for, or as Augustine would say, uh, he let God find him. Here's a brief little description of that uh, time from Professor William R. Cook. He's a professor of history at the State University of New York at Geneseo. It's interesting. Notice how they've prepared him for life. Notice the metaphor that he uses for the life that they're training him for. It's a war out there. Okay, it's the arena. And to be able to go out into the arena and win, you've got to be armed. Because it's a battle out there to get ahead in life. And what's the best armament you can have? Elegant speech. We, in some ways, do that today. Uh, we'll sit down with a student and prepare him or her for an interview for a scholarship. Uh, and, you know, you always, today, whatever else you talk about, say something about, now, don't wear that tie or don't, don't say things this way, or be careful of that slang phrase you use around us and don't do that, they won't understand. That there is obviously an element to that in all kinds of education, but it seems to have been the major force of the teachers that Augustine has to get you ready for this great battle in life. Life is a war and you've got to go out and win the war and you win the war by being the best armed guy. I mean, we sort of say it this way today, right? Whoever ends up in the end of his life with the most toys wins. Uh, and in a sense, that's the world Augustine is being prepared for rather than anybody ever asking the question, is that what life is or is that what life should be? Those questions to challenge the conventions didn't matter. It was learning how to win using the conventions and accepting the conventional morality of fourth century Roman society. I'd like to give you a little bit on the Manichaeans. That was the religion that Augustine was in for about a decade. Uh, this right here is just a little excerpt from uh, Dr. Christine Wood. Uh, she teaches theology at Catholic Distance University. She's a lecturer at the University of Notre Dame in Australia, not the one in the United States, and has also been a professor of theology at uh, John Paul the Great Catholic University in San Diego. This is just a little bit where she covers. So in the Manchaeans believed there was a good God and a bad God. It's called a dualist system. And she explains why that doesn't make any sense. And I just thought it'd be different for you to see somebody else. It's good to get a lot of views from a different number of sources here. Her video uh, is in the links as well. So, good and evil are not truly opposites. Evil is a privation. It is not a thing. Much like darkness is not a thing, it's what you have left when you remove light. Much like cold is not a thing. Cold is what you get when you take away the heat. <laughs> Evil is what occurs when you remove some of the goodness a thing ought to have. But you can't possibly remove all the goodness of something to get pure evil. Why? Because if you take all the goodness away from something, 
It means that the thing ceases to exist entirely. So that's why the dualistic system of the Manichaeans completely falls apart. So remember that Augustine wanted to be a public speaker that would move people, persuade people. Uh, if you were doing this, if he were doing this today, he'd be in marketing, advertising, uh, maybe teaching law school, be a high-powered lawyer, or possibly be a politician or help politicians. Uh, he was also a skilled teacher of it. So the idea was is that you know when he was spending the time at Carthage, that was too far away from the capital, Rome or Milan, looking at, depending on how you look at it. So he kept moving closer to where the power was, and the biggest power at that time was in Milan. That's where he ended up at. Uh, it just so happened that in being there, he was near the a bishop of Milan, which was St. Ambrose, and that took his life in a different uh, direction. Uh, remember that in his career, it was about persuading people even to do something wrong. He could lie. He could deceive. He could do anything wrong because that was that just like today, that's what people uh, do that want to get ahead. Uh, at the same time, he was looking for answers to how the world worked. He wanted to understand life. Uh, he joined the group that we talked about before, the Manichaeans from that previous video. And they seemed to have the answers, but when he asked questions, it kind of fell apart, just like you saw in that video. Uh, one of their leaders, his name was Faustus, uh, he was a big deal. He was kind of like a bishop for the Manichaeans. And he was a great speaker. Uh, Augustine liked being around him. He was a nice guy. But when they talked and Augustine asked him the hard questions about good and evil and, and the state of the world and how things came to be, Faustus had no answers. He, was, he had great style. He looked good, nice guy, but it was all talk with no good answers. Got no place. You know, Augustine is probably one of the writers that just about everybody in the world knows about. Uh, pretty much every major university is going to have some course that refers to Augustine in some way. Uh, his books have never been unavailable. There's never been a time where they weren't actively producing copies of his books in 1,600 years. Uh, so I listen to a lot of lectures by professors at various universities, and I can tell you that I've had uh, uh, professors in psychology mention him for his discussions of memory. Uh, in physics, uh, you can see over here at Stanford University, has an article that uh, refers to him when they're talking about time, uh, which, by the way, scientists still struggle with. Uh, the fall of Rome in history uh, is often going to use some of Augustine's writing because he was there. I mean, not in Rome at the time, but he was getting it close up. Uh, also, his life, the Confessions, is a kind of autobiography. And in his case, it's done in the form of prayer. So it's studied in literature. Uh, Great writers and poets have referred to Augustine's work or copied his style for 1,600 years. Uh, and then other subjects. He actually did some writing about teaching. Uh, there's just a lot of other things that it touches on. And he really was somebody that had a broad knowledge and understanding and a lot of interest. And just to uh, prove the point that uh, Augustine has studied at some pretty major universities, here's uh, Professor Paul Friedman of Yale University talking about why they're reading the Confessions as part of uh, his history class. Uh, by the way, I think it's interesting that uh, Professor Friedman is chair of the history department, also chair of the program in the history of science and medicine at uh, Yale University. So here he is. All right, so you may be asking yourself, why are we reading the Confessions? I think I gave a preliminary answer before, but um, since it seems to be perhaps more appropriate for religious studies or philosophy, let me remind you why we're struggling through this. First, the impact of Christianity on the Roman Empire, that is to say the sort of social and intellectual setting of the rise of Christianity in the late 4th, early 5th centuries. The second is uh, to understand some of the Christian moral and doctrinal problems and their implications. 
once again, we're not exactly interested in these for reasons of theology or morality, but we need to get into the minds of people at the time in order to understand what bothered them, what controversies they were involved in, and how those controversies indeed divided the Roman Empire and the successors to the Roman Empire. Some of those problems, well, under the, you know, that second heading of Christian moral and doctrinal problems, uh, let me just mention three, which by no means exhausts them, but are three that we can sort of, uh, if not identify with, I think see their importance. One, the problem of evil. Second, the relation between body and soul. And three, the Christian understanding of sin and redemption. Now, it turns out these are all aspects of the same problem. And they are dealt with in Augustine's works most thoroughly, more thoroughly than any other thinker of the ancient world. The third reason we're looking at this is the interaction between Christianity and classical culture and religion. Roman life and politics, Augustine's career and his giving up his career, what that means, uh, other ideas within the Roman <laughs> Empire such as Manichaeism, Platonism. And then finally, this is a document of philosophical and psychological investigation. And while that is not our primary purpose here, uh, you should not get out of a liberal arts college program without reading this and pondering it a little. This uh, can be summarized in terms of the importance of the humanities even, or of philosophical investigation as opposed to mere investigation of natural phenomena in words that Augustine uses in Book 10, which we have not read. After Book 9, Book 10 is a turning. It, it discusses time and the meaning of time. Books 11, 12, and 13 are a commentary on Genesis. Uh, worth reading, uh, uh, if you like, and interesting to think about how they do or do not mesh with the more confessional parts of the confession. But in Book 10 he says, um, men go out and gaze in astonishment at high mountains, the huge waves of the sea, the broad reaches of rivers, the ocean that encircles the world, or the stars in their courses, but they pay no attention to themselves. You can answer all three of these, or you can answer any ones that you want to in your response. Question one is, Augustine was trying to understand life even when he had a job that required him to lie. Do you ever feel split, like you want something good but keep going the wrong way? You know what's right, but for some reason you don't want to exactly do it? Just, you know, it's kind of hard? Question two is, Augustine's teachers didn't teach him how to live and that frustrated him. He looked back on it and said, why were they just telling me how to make money, how to be successful in the world, and not show me how I could actually live my life in a way that would be better? How will you learn how to live? Question three, you know, Augustine went to hear St. Ambrose speak and he thought he would also just be another great orator that would lie and, and do things that weren't very honest. But Augustine was really surprised that when he heard him, that the content was good. He was speaking the truth 
and that it wasn't that he was a great speaker. It's what he was saying made sense, although he was also a good speaker. Have you found anybody like that that knows a lot and that is really trustworthy? And if not, do you think of maybe being that person for others someday? There was a saying once that somebody said, be the person that you wish somebody would have been when you were young. Uh, I certainly try to do that, uh, hopefully for you. <laughs>